Someone say, thank God for the word. Where would we be without his precious, holy, written word? You say, Pastor Fred, you say that every week. Yes, and I'm going to keep on saying it because the word of God is never outdated. Come on, right? It never, it's not a fad. It's not something that comes and goes. The word of God is eternal, and it changes our lives eternally as well. By the way, we want to say welcome to our Facebook audience and our YouTube audience. Can you give them a round of applause? Thank you so much for tuning in as well. We believe God's going to minister to you as he does and will to each and every one of you here in the house today. So let's pray. We'll get right to it. Father, thank you so much for your precious, holy, written word today. And as we look to your word, we trust the spirit of God to give me utterance and unction. May you think through my mind and speak through my mouth. Bring revelation through my spirit, Father. May your power be in demonstration and manifestation today amongst the people of God, Father. And so, Lord, I trust you. I declare over everyone here in the house, those of you watching, that you are good ground. Everyone say, I'm good ground. You're good ground. That means you hear the word and receive it. I said, and receive it. And bear fruit. Some 30, 60, and finally a hundredfold in Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. The title of my message today, Treasures in Earthen Vessels or Flawed Vessels. Say that with me. Treasure in Earthen Vessels, Flawed Vessels. How many of you are thankful today that God doesn't clean you up before perfectly before he can use you. Or how many of you glad today that when you came to Jesus, he took you just like you were a mess? Right? <laughs> it's been said many times, you know, we're likened unto fish when, when Jesus said, behold, I'll, I'll make you fishers of men. And we all know that you don't clean up the, you, you catch the fish first. <laughs> then they get cleaned up. Right? <laughs> you can't get cleaned up before you get caught in Jesus. And so I want to talk today, not just the fact that we're flawed vessels, but there's a treasure in you. A treasure in you. And l- let's look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle of Grace, writing by the Spirit of God. I said he's writing by the Holy Spirit. This is, or you could say it this way, that the Holy Spirit is saying through the Apostle Paul. This is God's word. But Paul's writing, he says, for we do not preach ourselves. How many of you are glad for that, right? We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord. And ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Notice it it, it says, it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness and has shown in the hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Praise God forevermore. How many of you understand today, I don't care how dark you were, or how dark the world is, or how dark it seems the generation is, or our country is, or wherever else you want to go with darkness, it's everywhere. I don't care how dark it is, how many of you understand that the light of God's kingdom can penetrate any darkness, or any person, or however dark they are. Light always overcomes darkness. Did you ever think about it? That's why we have that's why we have flashlights to shine in the darkness, but there's no such thing as a flash dark. It's daylight out, so you have something and you try to shoot a beam of darkness. It can't, it can't happen. Right? Because light always overcomes darkness. How many of you are glad the day the light of God's grace and glory shined upon the darkness of your heart and transformed you forever through Jesus? But God commanded light through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I, I just feel quickened to say this and, and to speak this out because I'm not God, but how many of you know we are God's representatives on the earth? We are his ambassadors. We are his mouthpiece. We are his body, right? And so I just feel like right now by the Spirit of God, I command light. The light of God's word, the light of the power of the Spirit of God, to shine in your hearts and in the hearts of your family today. And I declare light to shine in our city and in our region, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I said the light of God to shine and drive out darkness, dark souls that seem hopeless. I declare light shine upon them and drive out. I don't care how dark it is, any little bit of light will drive out darkness every time. Darkness can never prevail. Over, never. You could, you could be in a huge stadium that's completely dark, and somebody get their cigarette lighter, and I'm, you know, you're going to see that light all over, the, all over the stadium. Right? The light of God's word. I declare healing grace, healing power, light to flow. In Jesus' name, over every one of you in the house. There's light that drives out sickness and disease. It's darkness is not from God. Can I tell you something? When sin came in the world through Adam, every foul darkness grabbed the coattail of sin and came in. Because Adam and Eve in the garden, they dwelt in light. The glory of God was their clothing. You say they're naked. They didn't need clothes because the glory of God, like a, like a shiny uh, globe, if you will, shined upon them. Wow. They walked with God. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no pain. There was no, not, none of that. But when sin came in, all, all the, the, the consequences of sin came, grabbed darkness, sickness, disease, depression, and everything the world suffers with, grabbed the coattails of sin and came into the world. But now through Jesus Christ, when Jesus took care of the sin problem, he took care of all the other mess that comes with us. Fear, depression, anxiety, disease, all of it. May the light of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ shine upon us. Shine upon our city, our region, and our nation. Glory to God. I said praise be to his mighty name forevermore. And so he says darkness is driven out by the light. And then he goes, but verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Or other translations say like clay vessels or flawed vessels, this, this body. We have this treasure that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. The Apostle Paul, he's getting a powerful revelation. He says, he says, listen, you have, when you got saved, when Jesus, through the power of his blood, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fullness, the heart of God is completely satisfied in the sacrifice of his son. I said it's completely satisfied. In other words, the war between God and man is over. Man's striving to, to get peace with God, striving to receive from God. Done. Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice. Never mind all those sacrifices in the temple. That God said, we're done with that. Jesus, the final one. Now through the blood, your sins, you are righteous by faith, and you have direct line with God, and God no longer says where he fellowships in us. And, and, the, and God is saying to us, when you got saved, when you called on Jesus, a powerful treasure was deposited, deposited on the inside of you. You have this treasure in this flawed, earthen body of flesh and mess-ups and not having everything together. But God said, never mind that. My blood took care of that. I'm moving in to your house, your body, your vessel. No matter how broken, no matter how the mess you got on, God said, when you call upon Jesus, download. Whew. Please understand, church, because I know, and, and, and too many times we focus on the, the flawed vessel 
rather than focusing on, on the treasure that's in us. Not knowing that the treasure that's in you will take care of the flawed vessel. I'm preaching good right now, and I'm just getting started. Mm. Do you recognize today, listen, the entire kingdom of God and of heaven, Jesus told his disciples, he said, boys, listen, there's something very powerful coming. The new covenant, the kingdom of God. A little while from now, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be crucified. They, they didn't get it. And they said, is the kingdom going to come at that time? Because we, we were tired of these Romans messing with us. Is that when you're going to overthrow the Romans and then we're going to finally have peace and get back to our land and all that? And Jesus said, well, no. That's for another day. That day will come. I said, that day will come. <laughs> Maybe not far from that. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. I I'm talking about a new covenant where there's something powerful happens. And, and, and Jesus said, and the disciples, where's the kingdom? And Jesus said, listen, in, in this day of the new covenant, don't look for the kingdom out here. It's not with observation. Remember he said that? There's the kingdom there. There we're going to do something. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. When that day comes, my death, burial, and resurrection, the kingdom of God is in you. Woo, a treasure. Wow. Jesus said the, the entire kingdom. Think about that a minute, church. All of heaven, all of heaven's resources, everything God stands for, his love, his healing, his power, his grace, the spirit of God, all the fruit of the spirit, the power of the spirit, all the promises of God are in you. No wonder it's a powerful treasure. And all you and I need to do is start unpacking some stuff. <laughs> wow. Everything you need. Well, Pastor Fred, I, right now I'm going through something. I need God's wisdom. I need joy. I need, I need an answer of peace. I got some financial things going on. There's some relationship problem. I need healing. I got all this. Everything Jesus said is in you. The whole kingdom. That treasure. In an earthen vessel? How can that be? I got flaws. I'm, I'm messed up. I got issues. Join the crowd. We all got issues. I said, we all got issues. People say, how can God dwell in them? We know what they're up to. What about you? Right? No. We all got stuff we're dealing with. Jesus did not come for perfect people. Otherwise, what? what? Right? And so we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power of God may be in the excellency of Christ. But we have it in earthen vessels, flawed vessels. Do you know the blood of Jesus is so powerful, he don't care how messy you are. He says, if you will trust in me, I'm coming in. I'm moving in, into your spirit, man, the part of you that's born again, and all that darkness and all that mess is moving out. I'm cleaning the house. When God says he's cleaning the house and all things become new, he's talking about in your spirit the kingdom of God comes. You're a new creature in Christ. Your flesh is still there. If you're short before you got saved, you're still short after you get saved. If you're bald before you get saved, you're still bald after you get saved. Right? And we could go on and on, but we'll just stop there. <laughs> right? Somebody says, Pastor, I'm building a mega church. I got, I, I, I got, yeah. Uh, but some of you got it. But anyways, but we have this treasure. And so the, the treasure is on the inside in your spirit man. And it comes in a flawed, in fact, it just seems like, it seems to me like, and it, you see it in the word of God, that God seems to relish and taking flawed, weak, broken people, broken clay vessels to shape and use them for his glory. Have you noticed that? 
In other words, he will take what the world says is a castaway, what the church many even says that God can't use them, and he will shape and mold them into a beautiful vessel for his glory. Why? Because the treasure has moved in. Give God praise right now. Praise his mighty name. That's why you can never say somebody's too far gone. Somebody's beyond. If you've seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution, you know that, that Chuck Smith was like, these hippies are, are they're, they're not, not even the hippies can get saved. They're so, he said they were so far gone. They're, they're, they're shoeless. They're homeless. They're hopeless. And, and not even God can. And his wife, thank God, said, honey, stop that. Nobody's beyond Jesus. And we, if you saw the movie, you know of the beautiful revival that broke out there. But God works through our failures, through our disappointments, and somehow he weaves them into the fabric of our divine destiny and future. He, he has a beautiful way of doing that. A flawed vessel, but somehow he, he works it. I've made mistakes, I'm I'm flawed, i got issues. Somehow God can take that and weave that into the fabric of your life and into your destiny and make it all come together for his glory. You say, I messed up. God saw it coming. And he said, just keep your heart towards me. Keep your hearts sensitive towards me. And, and, And he'll take even our failures. God saw it coming. He said, watch what I do now, please shape into something beautiful in that flawed vessel. Praise God forevermore. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, uh, watch, watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, consider who you were when God called you to salvation. Do we have any former hippies out there that were a part of that? A part of that? <laughs> okay, we got a few, a few of them. Okay, Martha, Ann, a few. I got saved during that revolution. I didn't even know there was one on. I was actually in Lawn Polk, California. My dad was stationed at, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, 1970. I'm 11, 12 years old. I shared before, I'm, I'm, I'm in my bedroom. I'm looking for Jesus. I, I somehow feel I need to be saved. And I'm in my bedroom one night, and, and my little brother Greg on the bottom bunk, and God starts visiting my bedroom by his spirit and glory. I'm like, what is this? And I didn't realize just down the street, down at the coastline, God's moving powerfully. I had no idea. But the presence that was going on there moved in my bedroom for several nights in a row until I said enough. And I called on Jesus and phew, was beautifully saved. <laughs> Praise God. Right during that revolution, I had no idea. <laughs> a few years later, filled with the Holy Spirit just, and, and God just moving in, in a beautiful way. But, but it says, brothers and sisters, consider who you were. When God called you to salvation. Many, many of us a mess. Not many of you were wise scholars of, by human standards. You weren't all that. Nor were many of you in positions of power. Not many of you were considered elite when you answered God's call. Right? But God chose those uh, whom the world considers foolish. To shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny. Did I say that right? I mean, I think that's what it says. And the powerless to shame the high and mighty. Wow. That's just like God, is it not? Right? He chose the lowly and the laughable in the world's eyes. Wow. That's just what happened in the Jesus Revolution. Nobody thought God could use the hippies. They're a bunch of nobodies and nothing. They got nothing. They're drug addicts. They're, they don't believe in working. They're all vegetarians. They don't eat meat. <laughs> what? How can God use that? They don't believe in working. Not all that. They were laughable in the world's eye. And even much of the church said, uh-uh. But wow. God used one man, Lonnie Frisbee, the, the catalyst of a powerful move of God who was a crazy hippie on LSD acid, acid trip, 
in Haight-Ashbury when he was about 18, 19 years old, and he was on an acid trip, and he just went up and took all his clothes off on this mountaintop, and he said, Jesus, if you're alive, I need something. And God visited him and poured out his spirit and saved him and gave him visions and dreams, and God used him to, as a catalyst for that movement. A hippie, lowly, laughable, nobodies. He chose those people so that he would sh put to shame the somebodies. He chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regard regarded as prominent. Weak vessels, broken vessels, mess. Does not the Bible say where sin abounds, where there's a mess, grace much more abounds? Yes. Wherever there's messy stuff, God's grace is poured out more abundantly. You're in a messy situation. You say, ah, no, be ready for God's grace to be poured out. Keep your heart humble. Keep looking to him, right? So that there would be no place for the proud, for prideful boasting in God. For it is not from man that we draw our life, but from God as we are being joined to Jesus, the anointed one. And now he is our God-given wisdom. Our virtue, our power, our holiness, and our redemption. Glory to God. Isn't that beautiful? Wow. And this fulfills what is written. If anyone boasts, let him boast in all that the Lord has done. That's why Jesus had a propensity, just a, a, I don't know how to say it, but the self-righteous, religious, hypocrites, Jesus disdained them. Not that he didn't love them. But their self-righteous, pompous attitude, I'm holier than thou. Look at me, I've kept all these laws, which they did not. I don't need a Savior. I'm my own Savior, basically. I'm self-righteous. I get my way on myself, and that's the mother of all sins. I said the mother of all sins. Self-righteous arrogance that I got it together. I don't need God. And it was a stench, and Jesus said, you white, I mean, Somebody said Jesus was really hard. Yeah, he was hard on the self-righteous, not the ones that believed in him. But Jesus, known as a friend of sinners, he's a sinners and, and harlots and, and social outcast. He, he was known as a friend to them. Of course, he was persecuted for it. He said, come, come to me. Come on. I'll give you rest. I'll forgive your sins. So all those that knew they were a mess, they came to Jesus. But the self-righteous holier than thou, Jesus had his harshest words for them. You guys are like a, a you guys are like a dead man in a whitewashed sepulcher. Like looking at a tombstone that has been whitewashed, clean on the outside, but inside full of dead man's bones. Whew. Who's he talking to? Self-righteous people. Not those who, who came to him, those who received him. Come on, he loved on them. He forgave them. He ministered to them. Right? And so may we always become fully dependent upon our Lord Jesus Christ. So God has a long history of using flawed and lowly people for his purposes. A long history. Including us as well. You remember in the book of 1 Samuel... Chapter 16, there was a, let's, have, let's look at that scripture. In the days of Israel, King Saul was the first king of, of Israel. And through his pride, through his rebellion, God rejected him. And he told Samuel, the prophet, go down and anoint a young man from the house of Jesse. And the Lord said to Samuel, well, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I've rejected him? Fill your horn with oil. Go, I'm sending you to the Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. So if you know the story, you know that Samuel the prophet came to Jesse's house. Jesse had like eight sons. And the youngest son who? David. David. David was the shepherd, and he stayed out with the sheep and got messy and took care of the sheep. By the way, in those days, shepherds were considered a lowly occupation. It was almost despising if you were a shepherd. 
And so the prophet shows up and said, we're going to have a gathering. And Jesse's like, and he tells Jesse, hey, God's appointed one of your sons to be, I don't know who, but I want you to line them all up in front of me. And I've got this oil in a flask, and I'm going to anoint the next king of Israel among your sons. Jesse, you're awesome. Boys, we're going to have a beautiful time tonight. One of you guys, come on, going to be the next king. And he lined them all, except for David. Never mind him. He, he's, no, it can't be him. And so the prophet stands in front. This is Elab the first, the oldest one. He looks tall, look good looking. He says, and, and he says, surely, surely the anointing's on him. Samuel the prophet, he gets his flask of oil out, and he says, he's got to be the one. And he pours it, and nothing's coming out. What? And then God speaks. And so it was, verse 6, so it was when they came that he looked at Elab, the oldest son, and said, surely the anointing, the Lord's anointing is before him. Nothing coming out. But the Lord spoke to Samuel and said, what? Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature. Because what? I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, the vessel, the clay vessel, the flaws. Right? The, 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 the mistakes. But God looks at the heart. Wow. And so Samuel goes through all of them. Surely the anointing. All seven of them. Nothing. And the oil will not flow. Finally he says, I'm pretty sure I heard God. Is this all your son, Jesse? Wait, well, actually there's one more David out there. But, you know, I, he's not. No. Can't be him. He's young, he's, he's, just, he's, he's out there taking care of sheep, he's stinky, and the prophet said, we will not sit down until that boy shows up. And Jesse's like, boys, go get that, go get your kid, brother. Really, dad, he stinks, he's got, he's got sheep poop all over him, he's, got, he's a mess, you know, and, and this is embarrassing. They bring the kid in, all smelly, and, and, and Saul takes one look at that boy. That's all he is, he's a young teenager. And he says, the, surely the anointing. And he takes the oil and says, we'll find out. And he turns over and psh, just pours down all over David. God anointed him to be the next king. The, the least likely. How many of you understand God uses the, the least likely to do the unusual? We see it all over the Bible. We see it in moves of God all over the earth. And so when you feel like you're disqualified, you feel like I'm the least likely in my family, like like. Gideon, I'm, I'm the least one. Get ready for God to blow up on your life and to use you in unusual ways that you've never been used before. Give God praise right now. Thank you, Lord. And so I remember, I remember when God first, I felt a stirring to the ministry in my own life. Uh, You've heard me tell the story. We were on working on a ranch just five miles out of town here. And this would have been like in the mid-80s. And I was fixing fence after a February storm way out in the West 40s. And God just started speaking to me about this is not your life's purpose. And I want you to go and go to Bible school and prepare for the work that I have for you uh, for, for the kingdom. And, and, I, and I remember instantly having thoughts in my mind. How many of you ever thought you can think a whole conversation in a split second? You can think like a two paragraphs, like a split second in your mind. And in my mind, when God began ministry, in my mind, I'm thinking, I, I, I don't qualify. It's, it just came across me. I don't qualify because um, uh, nobody, nobody on my, my family, either side, my mom or dad that I know of, None of them are, 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 are in the ministry. I don't even have any missionaries that I know of. Nothing. And in fact, my mom's side of the family, my mom's parents owned a tavern when my mom was growing up a bar. And, and mom tells stories that when she was a little girl, she would always almost live at the tavern because the tavern stays open at night where crazy stuff goes on. And she said she remembers that as a little girl, her parents told her and her little sister, go down to the basement and, and, and try to go to sleep because we got business up here. And mom remembers hearing the brawling and the fights that would break out and the swearing and all the stuff, the carnage that was going on in that tavern. And mom looks back on it and she says, thank God, because any of those drunks could have walked down the stairs right to where she was. And who knows? And mom says, I'm, I'm appalled at that. But my mom was invited to a, uh, uh, 
a youth camp when she was a teenager. And her and her sister went to a youth camp and got saved. Praise the Lord. And she's been serving God ever since. And by the way, my grandma and grandpa, before they passed, they got saved. So praise the Lord. They're all in, they're all in the kingdom of God. But, but I was thinking in my mind, I don't qualify. Nobody in my family is serving God. But in, in that moment, I heard God just spoke in my spirit and I wrote it down. This is what I felt in just a few seconds. This conversation happened. God said to me, if I qualify and call you, no one or nothing can disqualify you. In other words, the, if God calls, if God equips, if God anoints, no one or nothing, no devil can stop it. That's the same for every one of you. That God has equipped and anointed and called. And I don't mean you're going to have this big ministry. You're called to be a mom. You're called to be a dad. You're called to be a husband. You're called to have influence in your, in, in your, your uh, ministry or in your job place, in the marketplace, in the house of God. God's grace and God is anointed. Whatever God's calling is upon you, he's equipped you, and you're called by God. No one can disqualify you. Praise God. And so that calling, even though all these many years pastoring, I mean, we've gone through hell over the years. As pastors, you see us up here today. I run up here and we got smiles on our face. Every, every, every Sunday, my whole ministry, I come up here with a smile on my face, giving God praise. But many times during the, the hell's going on in our life. You don't know about it because we walk by faith too. When hell happens, we got to look to God and rejoice in him and trust his word, just like I preach to you every week. Every week we're running up here smiling, rejoicing, going through hell many times. But I never quit. Why? Because I knew, I knew that the call of God put upon my life, if God qualifies you, no one can disqualify you. And because of that word, it's kept us steady all these years. And that's why we, we never quit the ministry, even though hell was breaking out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And you hold fast to what God, like Cameron said earlier, whatever God has spoken to you, whatever God has dropped in your spirit, do not let the pressures of life talk you out of it because God has called you and equipped you and made you promises and he will bring them to pass. Praise the name of the Lord. So God anointed David that day. Despite all that, the most unlikely, and David is known after a man after God's own heart, a powerful king. So when you find your place, the anointing oil will flow. I said when you find your place where God's put you. Some of you are new to the house, but you know God's planted you here. The anointing will flow here. I hope you don't mind. I just, I just met this couple, Reed and Stacy, right, right over here. Just visited with them, first time here. And they said, Pastor Fred, we feel, we feel, we feel God, everybody's reaching out to us. We feel God's presence. They just showed up. And, but when you find your place, the, the oil will start flowing. No more of this going place dry. What? The world's not, not flowing for me. Now, maybe someone, that's fine. But when you find your place, when you find where God wants you, the oil of God's power and the spirit of God will start flowing. Alex and Martha, you shared with me before church. When you came, you felt God calling you, and the oil start flowing in your life, touching every area of your life. Praise his mighty name. Even though it was still many years before King David, be David became king, and he went through some stuff, he never forgot that day. The prophet, oil all over his head, the anointing. And the, anointing, the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forward. And helped him to fulfill his destiny. Praise the Lord. I'm almost done here. You remember the Apostle Paul. How many of you know before the Apostle Paul became the Apostle of Grace. Who wrote over half the New Testament. He was an enemy of the church. He was feared by all. He caused havoc in the church. Persecuting. He consented to Stephen, the first martyr, to his death. He had murder in his heart. We're talking about the great apostle Paul, who was known as Saul of Tarsus. In fact, very quickly, Acts chapter 9, we see, we see the powerful story here. Saul, this is 
who became Paul after he was saved. Saul still breathing threats and murder against the people of God. He went to the high priest, the scripture says, and he asked for letters from the synagogue so that he went to Damascus. Anywhere of the, anybody who trusted in Jesus, he would bring them bound and chained back to Jerusalem. But as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly, everybody say suddenly, thank God for the suddenlies in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones. Suddenly, right, a, a, a light like a beam came right down on Saul from heaven. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Jesus speaking to him, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? How many of you know at that moment he got saved? He said, who are you, Lord? He called him Lord. He knew, he asked the question, but somehow he knew. <laughs> this is the Lord Jesus Christ who I've been persecuting. Why are you persecuting me? It's hard to kick against my, your, the plans of God, if you will. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, arise, go to the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And Saul arose from the ground and went. His eyes were open, and he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he, he turned radically from a radical persecutor to somebody radical for Jesus. God dropped a treasure in him in that earthen vessel. And as I said, he was known as the apostle of grace to the Gentile, to the entire known world. But yet no one, even after he got saved, the church was like, I, no, I don't think so. Uh-uh. This guy, we heard, we know all about him. All the stuff, havoc he's called. He's, he's saved now. He's a child of God. God had to appear in vision form. Jesus had to appear in, to convince people that, he, no, he's really, he's a chosen vessel of mine. And so when we see people start coming to the Lord, they're going to be radicals that we thought they could never be saved. They could never turn to God. Maybe you have a child or a grandchild. Maybe you have loved ones. You see someone, they look too far. God, God says, that's the one I'm going to target right there in these last days and save them radically. And as much as they were against, that's how much they're going to be for. Praise God. I said, blessed be the name of the Lord. By the way, that, that Jesus revolution that happened, um, not only did God work powerfully amongst those hippies and amongst the people of God, but also the movement of Christian worship was, was transformed during that movement. Because prior to the late 60s and early 70s, all the churches sang nothing but hymns or barbershop quartets. That's all they did. And the younger people were like, I, I don't know about this. But when God started moving on those beaches in California, started moving up the coastline and spread all over America and even the world, people started rising up and sing. And God ro rose up a, a musical artist that began to write contemporary Christian music that caught on in those days. And now we enjoy it to this day. Now, we're not saying some of those old hymns still have an anointed on and Cindy can make those old hymns flow beautifully, right? But thank God that they, 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 they rose up and guys like Chuck Gerard and Love Song and, and Keith Green and Barry McGuire and Randy Stone. It goes on and on. God, these guys, God raised them up. And they started singing songs. One of my songs, when we, when we were just in the early 70s, I, and I, I'll, I'll try to sing it, but you remember this song? It says, Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. Sing it if you know it. I know you are thirsty. You won't be denied. Remember that? I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you that for those tears I died. That song was the signature song of the Jesus movement. The late 60s started, and many other songs came in. And that's why today our, our worship is revolutionized because of the step of faith that they took out. I'm going to close with this scripture, just my, my final scripture and a few thoughts. Jeremiah chapter 18. How many of you are glad for that treasure on the inside of you? Praise God forevermore. Thank you, Lord. 
May we unpack everything that's in us of the whole kingdom of God for your glory. But the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from, from the Lord saying, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, Jeremiah, and there I will cause you to hear my words. I want to teach you something. Go down to the potter's house. And he went down to the potter's house, and there he was, the potter, making something at the wheel. I remember in the eighth grade, I, I had the pottery. Anybody in school, you got that clay and put it on the potter's wheel and shaped, made vessels. Anybody besides me? Yeah, we did that. But he, but he says, there, there, there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Somehow he made a mistake and something happened and the vessel just kind of fell apart. How many of you understand today that I don't care if you've been marred. I don't care if you've made wrong choices. I don't care if you've turned your back and you've gone your own way. and You've had horrible seasons in the past and things have happened. You're like the vessel that has been marred. But does did the potter just take that pump of clay and throw it out and be done with you? No. The scripture said he, he, the, potter, the potter, potter made it again into another vessel. As it seemed good to the potter to make. As I said, despite our failures, our mistakes, and it's martyr and I messed up. God says, okay, let me get a little water here. Because you need water to soften that. The word, the Holy Spirit. And God says, come on, receive my word. Receive, receive my, let me shape your life into something beautiful. It has been a mess. As I want to do it. Not as you want, but as me. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look as this clay is in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand. And I want to close by saying, listen, there might be some of you here today and you just feel like you've been that clay and you've gone your own way and you feel like there's the clay of your life or it's been marred. But God says, let me come to you. Receive me and I'll, I'll mold you into a vessel of something beautiful and I'll put a powerful treasure in that vessel in your life that will draw out all the richness that God has for you. Father, thank you so much for your word today. For these powerful truths. We're earthen vessels flawed. But yet you put a beautiful treasure of your love, your spirit, your power, the whole kingdom in us. And I pray just now for those in the house, those of you watching. If you feel like you're just clay, you, your life has been marred. There's, there's been mistakes. There's been mess ups. Will you let the potter, the Lord Jesus Christ, mold you into something beautiful and put a treasure in you. You have to say yes to him. Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. There's no in between. Either Jesus is your Lord and Savior and you have eternal life or he's not. And you have eternal destruction. The choice is yours. But you can say yes to him today. And he'll come in and deposit a treasure in you that will shape your life and your future so beautifully. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed here in this house, those of you watching as well, if you say today, Pastor Fred, I want that treasure on the inside of me. Maybe you're not sure if you're a child of God or, or not. Maybe you're not sure if your sins are forgiven. Don't walk out of here with no, without knowing of a certainty that you're saved, that you have a treasure in you, that your sins are forgiven. If that's you, or maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Fred, I, I am saved, but I've, I've gone my own way. I've done my own thing. I'm done with that. I want to recommit and reconsecrate my life to the Lord. I want his best. I want to be that clay that lets God mold and shape my life into whatever he wants, not what I want. So if that's you, you need Jesus, or you want to rededicate your life, just you feel God moving upon you, just lift your hand up right now, right where you're sitting. Say, Pastor Fred, pray for me. I need Jesus or I want to rededicate. I want to recommit my heart to the Lord right now, very boldly. Thank you. I see your hand over here. God bless you. Who else? Include me in that prayer. We're going to pray in just a moment. I need Jesus or I want to recommit my heart and my life. I'm going to look around. Anyone else with an uplifted hand? Those of you watching as well, some of you pray this prayer with me. Let's say this prayer. Even if you didn't lift your hand, say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, please say it out loud, everyone. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I make Jesus Christ both Lord and Savior of my life. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for a new beginning and a fresh start in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you give a round of applause? Come on, those that called on Jesus. We're rejoicing with you. Thank you so much. That is the most powerful uh, experience you could ever have. We're so proud of you. Please keep coming to church. Please bring your friends and your loved ones. They need a touch of Jesus as well. And thank you again for letting Cindy and I be your pastors. We know you can go to church wherever you like. Thank you for trusting us to feed you the word of God each and every week. How many of you believe the word of God is working in your heart and in your life? Thank you so much for that. We love you. We treasure each and every one of you. I'm going to speak a blessing over you. And then uh, Cameron is going to come and close out the service. Lift your hands up. I'm going to speak this blessing over you, your family, your loved ones throughout this week. As your pastor, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord protect and prosper your way. According to Psalm 91, that you dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. And may God give his angels charge concerning you. That no evil plague, disaster, or calamity comes near your dwelling. And may God place you at the right place, at the right time, with the right people. And may the treasure inside of you come alive in Jesus' name. And finally, may his shalom peace and rest be your constant companion throughout this week. In Jesus' name, say amen if you receive that. God bless you.